Hello traders, it's Wednesday, December the 28th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly, what we can expect in the coming 24 to 72 hours ahead of us. And yes, that does include through the end of the week. We are generally seeing what we expect at this time of year, a lack of liquidity translating into a lack of volatility. In fact, some of the activity level is so low that we're getting levels uh, comparable only to what we had seen approximately five years ago around the same time so not even just very low in terms of activity uh, for the holiday versus the rest of the year but even from holiday to holiday so very quiet conditions and it certainly is showing though despite the lack of progress that we have on many of these markets including the dollar which you're seeing here uh, major benchmarks like the euro usd or even the dollar yen uh, but also from the likes of uh, u.s equities and even more uh, out there risk oriented assets like emerging markets and the high yield fixed income uh, we are seeing some remarkable amount of uh, scheduled event risk and uh, unexpected uh, fundamental headlines yet still not gaining that kind of traction that we're looking for. I think one of the most noteworthy developments that we had through this past 24-hour session on the docket was the U.S. Consumer Confidence Report. This is the conference board's measure, so this is usually a little bit uh, later than the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Report, but I like this one a little bit more. The reason is I think that there are uh, more categories that have greater appeal or more substance. This was remarkable in that it gave us the highest reading that we had seen in 15 years. Uh, beyond that, we would also see in the details uh, some very interesting things. One of the more uh, remarkable statistics that we had actually seen in this report was the suggestion that uh, expectations for higher st stock prices uh, going forward was actually the highest we've seen in 18 years. That's uh, equivalent to the buildup in the dot-com boom era. That is really remarkable. That is extraordinary confidence. And yes, some of it has to do with the uh, transition of the election. Although the election uh, doesn't really matter who was voted into power, uh, presidential power only goes so far in terms of confidence generating. Nevertheless, it does give a remarkable outcome. Uh, you can see here, this is actually the Consumer Conferen Conference's uh, Confidence Sentiment Survey. Uh, after each of the previous elections going back 40 years. And as you can note in the black line, which is the current one, this is an impressive uh, uptick, but it certainly isn't uh, the extreme uh, increase that we had seen in some of the previous years, like 1996, uh, and certainly from 1976, but I think the most noteworthy was the, uh, the, sorry, the 2004 surge, uh, though it, most of these don't really hold that high. Also, they started at significantly lower points. But the performance from the markets since the U.S. presidential election remains robust. Uh, we have the S&P 500, once again, comparing the S&P 500's performance post-election going back over the past 40 years. And you can see in the black that it's only being outpaced at this point by the 2004 rally. Uh, we have the VIX volatility index, which we want to see slump, already at a natural low there, so there's not much progress we can make beyond what we've already seen. The dollar index is, at this point, only behind 1992's uh, performance, which didn't really hold up. This is actually uh, starting 20 days back and then going forward. Uh, if you actually look at it from day of election thereafter, it's only 1984 uh, that is showing a better pace. So very remarkable post-election, and yes, going into 2017, this is going to be a big topic, what the U.S. political landscape actually looks like, more in terms of what promises that were made during the campaign trail uh, will actually make it into legislation and ultimately law, and how quickly, all right, there is a big expectation of a fiscal stimulus coming under the new president, but we need to see it actually take shape and uh, make its way through all the relevant bodies for approval. Uh, if we don't get that in a timely fashion, it is certainly a very buoyant, uh, optimistic market, certainly outpricing or out 
outpacing uh, optimism uh, as it would be seen in actual economics and financial positioning. So there's a stretch here. This is a risk leaning market and it's already at excess. We need to see something give body to these expectations. All right, so that sentiment survey was certainly very noteworthy. Uh, we would get a positive performance on the S&P 500 or the Spider ETF, as you see here, down on a four-hour chart. But we wouldn't really see it translate too well into dollar. Uh, the dollar index, the XY dollar index, not showing much progress whatsoever. Very narrow range bar, uh, and it is falling generally within congestion. Let's go down to an hourly chart. That's the kind of price action we're, we're dealing with right now. Furthermore, when we look at uh, major pairs and we take a measure of recent volatility compared to what we had seen over, let's say, the past month. And this is kind of an assessment of how uh, conditions are in terms of volatility relative to what we've seen uh, in, in recent markets. All right? Not just comparing it to now and, let's say, the middle of the most active time frames, but rather how active it is now compared to how active it has been recently. That's exactly what I went for in this uh, indicator. It's essentially measuring uh, recent uh, average true range or volatility uh, compared to a more medium term. So 5-day ATR versus 20-day ATR. And you can see it has plunged. It is actually the lowest we have seen since back at the end of, Dece of 2011. V extremely quiet. Now what I read from this, yes, it is largely a reflection of the market conditions, but it is also evidence of markets that are in a very tense position when liquidity returns. This is going to be resolved, not just in a breakout, uh, because conditions are too quiet and the patterns are very thin, but we are trying to support a break to uh, fresh 14-year lows for the euro USD, the most liquid currency pair in the world, and it needs to have either traction with conviction or the short-term interest in that break is going to evaporate and it's going to turn us quickly. All right, this is something that's going to be hanging over our heads. This can actually happen during the low liquidity period that we're still facing over the next days, but uh, I wouldn't trust it for any kind of meaningful trend if it does happen uh, before liquidity returns as of next week. Now, speaking of the Euro USD, we would also ha also have headlines from Euro. Uh, m data and the uh, the markets are generally dead in Europe. But we do have uh, some headlines like the ECB announcing uh, that the Monte de Pachi uh, bailout is going, to, or the requirements for a bailout to make them uh, financially solvent are going to be far more than the already uh, missed 5 plus billion euro recapitalization. They think it's going to take a little bit more uh, than 8.8 .8 billion euros. So already uh, a uh, struggle to actually meet the demands, and the ECB makes it far more bleak uh, for them. So watch out for headlines like this. Obviously didn't do much to the euro, uh, not just the euro USD. It also didn't do much for the likes of the euro pound, uh, but it certainly can, these very thin liquidity conditions. Uh, looking at uh, regional things like uh, Italian ETFs and bourses is also going to be very important, especially if you trade uh, sovereign credit rating uh, linked assets. All right, so noteworthy headline, not a big uh, market mover either. Uh, another very important region that I'm keeping very close tabs on is China. And China was uh, certainly worthy of a couple of headlines, uh, though, once again, the price action you would see on the offshore, or sorry, the onshore, the CNY, the, the renminbi, uh, and the CNH, the uh, offshore, uh, wasn't making very good progress. But a couple of headlines from that uh, includes, uh, well, uh, the data that we actually had on the docket was for um, the Chinese version of the Beige Book, which is actually done by a private company, but it is, and it's anecdotal stories, but it is certainly much more... Uh, trustworthy than some of this uh, government data. What we saw in the indicator was uh, an improvement in a lot of the statistics for the world's second largest economy uh, for the fourth quarter, including uh, all industries showing significant gains. Although there was some concern about uh, corporate cash flow and obviously the debt issues that uh, China, China faces are still lingering, uh, but uh, 
that was counteracted a little bit by another headline that I'd seen, I think, primarily from Bloomberg, uh, which suggested that there was a significant uptick in trading activity in uh, Chinese yuan flows, which they associate to uh, possible reading of capital outflow. Now, that m might or might not be the case. It all depends on the circumstance. But given <laughs> what we're seeing in the dollar CNH and dollar CNY, which are making dramatic and aggressive moves to the upside, uh, I don't think this is uh, through any uh, positive inclination to see one's currency to value and subsequently provide a better uh, trade advantage as China usually wants it. I think this is evidence of capital outflow. And we are seeing it from some other uh, aspects, uh, but generally it's it's significantly appreciated on a local basis because there are strong capital controls and there's also a significant uh, uh, undervaluing of this risk from the international community. But we can see things like uh, the Hang Seng or the A shares uh, or other uh, ETFs like the FXI. They show some pullback, but I don't think that it, appro uh, that it approximates the risk that this represents. Uh, we also see the HKD, the dollar HKD, which is a uh, an outlet or a channel for uh, capital flows from China, mainland China, and you can see some of the pressures building up, but they're getting better control over making this a signal for fear like it was back at the beginning of 2016. All right, so a number of headlines popping up, but really not a whole lot of traction being made. I think one of the more noteworthy moves was from oil. Uh, this wasn't really founded on any tangible new uh, news or surprise and data. Uh, rather, it was floated that the, the OPEC uh, production cuts, which will start on January the 1st, are generating more confidence. I, this is just the media flipping one story for another. Either they are confident in the upcoming production cut or they're skeptical of it, and they just use whatever headline matches price action rather than uh, whittling it down. Not their fault because this is a lot of speculative, thin liquidity market kind of activity, exactly what you'd expect, volatility, lacking conviction, uh, and it's not going to be a pro uh, prominent story until we have either persistent trend or something dramatic happens in the OPEC, non-OPEC group, uh, but we can't see that happening until it actually occurs. So. Noteworthy price action, but exactly the same kind of price action I would expect uh, in terms of sticking to general range. Keep your eyes on the headlines and certainly on the docket, although the docket items are relatively light in the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, don't expect too much in the way of major movement, but if something is going to occur, it's going to happen in one of these channels that are very deeply rooted and very exposed to high level potential volatility. Amongst them is going to be things like risk trends. Uh, so looking at something like the S&P 500 and other risk oriented assets, my preference obviously is dollar yen. Look at that very tight wedge that we're carving there uh, on the top of that chan that trend channel. Um, these will be very exposed, as will things like China and uh, perhaps even the likes of Brexit if something substantial comes about on that front. But don't expect it to happen. Just be prepared if it does. And if you are intending to trade anything during this week and it's meant to be short term, shoot for reasonable objectives. I mean, very nearby targets with very stringent stops. Uh, these are not very productive market conditions. And if you're trying to squeeze too much out of it, you're probably going to be, uh, your account's going to be the one that's going to be squeezed, not the market. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.